The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live and Learn. My name is Kim Hachia. On my segment today, we'll be talking to two friends who have created a YouTube channel called Naturally Nebraska. Stay tuned. It's a really a beautiful, beautiful little show. Hello, and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Lincoln is blessed to have lots of great local musicians, and many of them are generous with their times and give back and play at the retirement communities. One of those is Gene Davis. He's here with us today. We're gonna to learn a little bit about his life and he's gonna play some music for us. It'll be lots of fun, don't go away. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake. Have you ever been to the Lincoln Arts Festival? It's been going on for a long time and it's very special. Troy Gagner is here with us today to give us all the details. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Bill Ainsley. Diabetes and prediabetes are conditions that you can control. With me today, for more information, is dietitian Karen McWilliams. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hi everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. You know, um, I want to give a big shout out to my friends down at LNK TV and to Aging Partners for putting the show together. My name's Kim Hachia and I'm coming from my uh, COVID safe bedroom here in Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, I have two guests today who are my friends, Jane Holt and Mary Kay Roth, and they produce a show that runs on YouTube that they call Naturally Nebraska. And we're gonna see a couple of minutes of that show right now. North 27th Street, just past Arbor Road. It's a super cool, wild place. It's got Salt Creek tiger beetles. It's got saltwort plants, both of which are endangered species. And it's got the feel of the pioneer days. So join us for this episode of Naturally Nebraska. Jane and Mary Kay, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Somebody give me a uh, elevator speech about what Naturally Nebraska is. Uh, I, I would say it's a love song to the outdoors. Um, it's a nod to CBS Sunday Morning's end pieces. Uh, it's a way for us to nudge folks to spend do time outdoors, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> So Mary Kay, how did you guys get the idea for this show? Well, I'm going to, this was Jane's idea. So I would like her to leave <laughs> this question. I want to underline, this was Jane's idea. I am the very lucky person that she asked to join her, but let, let's let her start that, this answer. Uh, it, it, it's roots are a bit peculiar. My brother was telling me a year and a half ago about this YouTube channel with thousands of followers who every morning tune in to watch this woman eat. And, and I thought that was, that was bizarre. And I said, shoot, people want to go on nature outings with me. Maybe I should have a YouTube channel of nature outings. So that really was the impetus, that, that funny conversation um, that got me thinking that, in fact, maybe we could do something like that. And well, I would add, can I add something? Yes. Um, Jane and I are neighbors. We retired about the same time, and we both love to go to Holmes Lake and watch the sunrise. And so we would run into each other out at the lake at the sunrise and we both posted photos on our Facebook page. And we got two kinds of responses. We got people who said, I will never get up in the morning ever. And so that is a gift to us, thank you. Or we got people that we actually ran into um, on top of the dam at Holmes Lake. And they would say, the only reason we're here is because we saw you post photos on your Facebook page. And so when I think about Naturally Nebraska, I think about we're giving a gift to those who will never get outside and will never go to Yankee Hill Lake to watch the sunset. At the same time, I think, as Jane said, it is a nudge for folks to, you know, you can, you can go to the ocean, you can go to the mountains, but oh my gosh, look around our own state and our own city, and it is absolutely gorgeous out there. Well, I know that when you first posted the Shoemaker Marsh um, video, several people on the page where you posted it said, well, I didn't even know this place existed. 
and yes, it's in the north part of Lincoln, and it's part of the saline wetlands, and um, it's, it is kind of a hidden gem, and I think you have done a really great job in sort of letting people know. You said today, this you posted your 60th episode <laughs> this morning. Um, it's been kind of a COVID project, and um, hmm. <laughs> so, you know, and I know that it takes takes kind of a village to put this together. Tell, it's not just you two that are working on this. So tell us a little bit more about who else is working on the project. One of the one of the most delightful things about this show is is a village. When we first started, uh, Jane's brother Steve Raglan created the logo. Um, the son of one of our friends, Sam Rice, created the theme music that you hear most of the time at the beginning of the um, beginning of the end of the show. But as far as each week, it's um, Jane and me. And then when we started out, Jane's daughter, the wonderfully amazing Allison Holt, did a lot of the video and post production. At some point, she got very busy with her work. Um, I once worked with Doug Dickinson at Lincoln Public Schools in communications. We both retired together, and so we asked Doug if he would be willing to help us. So from then on, it has been Jane and Doug and um, and me doing all of the work and doing all of the show. Um, Doug is a wizard. He does a lot of wonderfully creative things. He puts the music behind it when we need it. He's the one that got the drone for the one that we just watched. Um, Jane and I have started to do some video, but we're just, we, we experiment. I think it's interesting that you both say this is a post-retirement project or a gig for you, um, which, which I find interesting, the idea that in retirement you two have sort of stepped a little bit outside your comfort zone to start a new project. And um, would, if I characterize that right, or it, what do you think about that? Um, I would say what I usually say, which is you can't limbo under the bar we've set for ourselves, <laughs> um, which is uh, great. We have no boss. No one pays us. Sometimes no one pays us any attention. But um, it, So I, I love nature. Um, I love I'm a master naturalist, so I'm interested in promoting the outdoors. Um, and um, Mary Kay, I was lucky enough that she's my neighbor and is also a master naturalist. So it just seemed like a really fun project um, to explore places that we both know and don't know and to tell small stories about those places. So uh, was it a leap? Uh, it was kind of a freeing leap, but I think we both felt comfortable uh, not holding ourselves, uh, to taking ourselves too seriously so that we could enjoy it. That is the, that is the beauty of retirement that you that you have wings and you can do anything that you want to do and there's nobody looking over your shoulder there's nobody you know when you're working for a school district you want to be respectful of that school district <laughs> and you have you have you can do and and there's also if not now when so why not experiment and do some different things like kim you're doing something different in retirement it it is the time to to fly it also is the time if you have as jane said if you have a passion i do believe that we both believe in climate change um making sure that we protect our natural resources the first step for that is to tell people to appreciate it and get out and look at it and so this is a really nice nuanced way to do that yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and full disclosure, I'm a master naturalist too. So we're all just sitting here, you know, yay, what a great project. Um, I think we're gonna roll another piece in its entirety now. Um, and it's it's a really evocative, lovely piece. Um, and once we get it queued up, um, we'll just listen to the amazing Marilyn Moore reading a poem. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow.
My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. So that's probably the most famous poem in all of the English language, except for <laughs> Mary Had a Little Lamb, and Marilyn did a beautiful job reading it. How did you come up with the idea for that? And where did you photograph that? Uh, what I love about this is it really is a collaborative project. Um, I love that Doug can have ideas and lead us and Mary Kay has ideas and lead us and I occasionally have ideas and lead us. Um, and so Doug, after Mary Kay and I, Mary Kay and I shot that video both at uh, Wilderness Park, Mary Kay did that, and then I was just at Woods Park in my neighborhood. So we submitted the video and Doug said, I think we should ask Marilyn to read this poem. And and um, it was serendipitous. Uh, and I, that's one of the things I like most about the project is the way that it flexes and bends towards people's interests, um, that it honors their ideas. Uh, so that that ended up being really magical. I, I gave it extra hits by watching it multiple times because I just thought it was terrific. Well, and in addition to that, we didn't even talk about that that was the show we were going to do. But that morning, it was so beautiful outside that I end up heading for, for Wilderness Park. Jane ends up heading for Woods Park. And we get back that morning and we tell each other that we've taken video and we hadn't even planned it. So you have the beginning that's not planned and then you have Doug take it to a to another level that that as jane said that's one of my favorite things i remember we went out to holmes lake one time i don't even remember what the idea was but the, the wind was so strong that we couldn't hear and we were going to just throw in the towel and we ended up doing a show on the wind so i i love how we just let it go and as jane said sometimes it's lots of times it's jane's idea or doug's idea or my idea we just go with it so do you guys storyboard or anything? It, it, it sounds like a lot of this is just sort of lucky serendipity, which I also love that concept. We do not, we do not storyboard. We don't even always know what the introduction is going to be until about 30 seconds before Doug points the camera at us. So we let it go. I mean, a lot of times we'll say, um, oh, let's do a sunset. Sunset is great at Yankee Hill, Yankee Hill Lake. And, and, and so a lot of times we will, we will plan out who's gonna do the intro? Jane and I pretty much take turns, um, but there there is not a lot of elaborate planning. We let it, we let it lead us. So how, um, how much longer are you guys gonna do this? I hope it's forever. Jane, how long are we gonna do this? <laughs> See, what day is today? No. <laughs> um, we, we had folks who, uh, assumed it would last a month and that we got to our 60th today um, either speaks ill of them or well of us. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I think the joy is that you realize there are thousands of ideas and um, because we're all pretty easygoing and flexible with our time, many of those ideas can come to fruition. So uh, it would have it would be something peculiar to stop us at this point. And I would, if I could say, that COVID changed it in the sense that it made it uh, somehow even more necessary. I don't know that this project was necessary for other folks, um, 
but I heard from teachers who said they were showing clips and episodes to kids. Um, and we tried to honor the, the COVID protocols. Uh, we used to both open, then we would open one masked and one behind. So it's, it's been interesting uh, how, how the pandemic has changed the project to a, a, an extent as well. Well, I know you, you just said it was uh, it wasn't maybe necessary, but I think it was necessary for you. I think uh, we both have journalistic backgrounds, and so it's. I mean, we see ideas everywhere. As once upon a time, you would see news stories everywhere. We see ideas everywhere. So I don't think we will ever run out of ideas. And if anybody um, has watched our blooper show, you will know how much how much fun we have when we were doing the drone show we were laughing so hard i think i think jane had to do the introduction 20 times because we were just laughing and i i believe that people i hope people feel the joy that we that we get and that i hope they feel yeah i i, I do feel that and i have to admit that i look forward to um as the kids would say a new one dropping on fridays because <laughs> I do, I do enjoy that, and I, um, I, I find find them sort of a moment of zen almost, um, which I think you guys have done a really nice job of capturing um, the beauty of Nebraska. And um, I know you've shot all over the state. There was one from Lake McConaughey and maybe other places that. Um, so it's it's not just limited to Lincoln and Lancaster County, which I also I also like. I think that. Um, that's added a lot of color to the show. Well, so, Jane, Jane went to the Sand Hills, so she did an episode on the Sand Hills. I went to Lake McConaughey, so so we've so we've sort of piggy banked on if we're going to take a vacation in Nebraska, go ahead and do a show on it. Why not? Yeah, that I really like that. The other thing is, you know, 25 years ago, this would not have been possible because nobody had a camera or a video camera. Now we have these and you know, the technology has advanced so much that you can just do these from your desk and make it fun. So kudos yeah. to you guys for, you know, picking up picking up the, the reins and thinking about a little bit outside the box and having fun at that. And Kim, you know, you have been such a nice fan, but you also have given us ideas. So thank you. Thank sure. you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very meaningful. I mean, I'm grateful to everybody who watches, but especially to people who say, you should go here, you should go there, you should go hear the peepers or, you know, whatever. That that really, we, we often will um, pick up an idea. Well, good. You yeah. know what? I told you I would tell you, we're out of time. And we're out of time. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Mary Kay and Jane, for um, being my guest today. And, um, sort of exposing people to a slice of Nebraska that maybe they don't know about and um, being taking a risk and uh, limboing under that low bar. <laughs> so I just want to remind my our viewers that it's never too late to live and learn about the state of Nebraska. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. very thought of you and I forget to do the simple little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host Jerry Renault. You've been listening to some of the great music that's been produced by a local artist here in the city of Lincoln. Lincoln, Nebraska is a great place for music. Always has been. Lots of great touring bands come through at some of the uh, local um, bars and restaurants in town. We have the Lead Center, we had Pershing Auditorium, we have the Devaney Center, all kinds of great acts have come through. But Lincoln is also a home to 
a lot of really great local musicians and local musicians who give back their time in lots of different ways. We have one of those musicians with us today. His name is Gene Davis. Gene, welcome to our program. Thank you, Jerry. I'm glad to be here. You have been performing um, in the area for at least 30 years or so. Um, been involved in uh, country bands, you've been involved in folk bands, you've been involved in rock and roll bands, some jazz bands, and now you're even doing some playing at uh, some retirement mm -hmm. uh, communities around town. So you've had really quite a career. But let's talk before we do the music and before we have you play a little bit for us uh, about how you got to that point. You grew up, you call yourself a border kid because <laughs> you were sort of half Nebraska and, and half Iowa. Tell yes, I grew up in the uh, South Sioux City area. And of course, one of those border areas where three states touch, so there's really, you're almost not part of one state. During uh, school, of course, I played band instruments, played trombone mostly. Oh, there you go. And, but I had kind of a different, uh, a different route than some people. After I got from out of high school, I put the, all the music down for about four or five years when I came down here to uh, go to university. Wow. And my brother John, four years younger, started playing in bands when he was in high school. He was one of those kids, he was gonna make his own way, go his own route. And he actually got me back into playing music. As I was just about to graduate from college, he kinda, why don't you play a guitar? Why don't you, why don't you get something going? And then I was able to become proficient enough that he, I joined a band that he was in, and that kinda started me back on playing music for really the rest of my life. Very cool. So tell me about some of the influences. It's always fun to, to talk to you because it's almost impossible to mention a musician that you haven't heard of, you haven't listened to, you know every bass player that's, that's ever played out there. What were some of those early influences? You, you grew up in a real interesting time in uh, uh, late 50s into the 60s and 70s, uh, so there was a lot of interesting music being produced at that point. Uh, the biggest influence was my mother, actually. She was a very talented singer and pianist. And even though, uh, even though I didn't follow those roots then, I never sang in, in choirs or in anything like that, uh, the music was always around and I developed a love for it very early. When I was in college, uh, the group of people that I lived with was um, very into different kinds of music. We had, uh, so we would come into the apartment or the house where we were living in and put on a platter. <laughs> That's old school. Oh yes. <laughs> and the next person that came in would, when that finished, we'd put on a different one, we'd put on a different one. So there was so much music to be heard then. And um, as I said, that was, this was even before I started playing guitars and everything. So I had a large reservoir of, of actually tunes and things and styles of music before I, actually, before I actually started playing the guitars for myself to try to put that to some use. Very nice. Uh, I think most of your career, uh, at least the early part of it, was you played bass guitar. Yes. Um, and you remember you said one time, what I really want to do is sing, but I had to play an instrument, so I thought bass was maybe the place I should go. But was that kind of with the trombone background mm -hmm. that uh, it sort of led you to bass, or did you start with a, a guitar and then move to bass? That's part of it. Um, like my last semester in college, I had picked up an acoustic guitar and was just up in, upstairs in my room practicing with it. Um, when I started working with my brother, uh, the band, we need a bass player, so okay. And uh, so I switched over to bass and was pretty busy doing that, but was, what was also nice was that in that band, uh, I, was, you know, you, I was told you not only have to play bass, you have to sing as well. So I learned the singing and the playing at the same time. So um, as my, you know, 30 years later, I circled back around and started playing a lot more guitar and singing. But that's how I got into playing bass because that was the, the path that was available then. I think there were a lot of people that took that, uh, took that same path. Um, let's talk about some of these bands that, uh, that you played with, um, a lot of them out of, out of Iowa. Um, mm -hmm. But you say you played some in, in Lincoln uh, and Omaha and in the Nebraska area as well. Um, one of them was pretty famous, at least in, in the region, right? Yes, um, the band you're talking about is a, a band called The Great Imposters. They were very popular around the Omaha area, really from the 60s on. And um, the leader of that band continued the band into the, uh, into the 1990s and 2000s. And uh, that's when I met Bob, Bob Fields, that would, that's who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So when the time came and they were inducted into the uh, Iowa Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as the band, The Great Imposters, um, they'd had many members through their, through their history. And uh, he was given the choice of, well, you can, in, of the naming a few members, you can actually induct as part of the band. And uh, I was very fortunate that I was one of the people that he chose to induct. Oh, that's very nice. What was that like? I mean, uh, oh, well, it's rather, it's kind of fun. Um, you're sitting there and, and some people collect autographs, so you're signing autographs for people, something that never happened to me very much. And uh, you're recognized at the, uh, uh, at the ceremonies. Uh, where they have bands playing, some of the most famous bands playing and everything. So it, w it was quite fun and, re and it was, uh, um, I, I wish I had some more pictures of what happened actually. Oh yeah. So this was, this was mostly 50s music, is that right? Is that what that was? Well by the time I joined the band it was uh, 50s and 60s but also some more pop recent stuff. Uh, the band played variety so you, we played, uh, oh my goodness with that band I played all the way from the Lake of the Woods in Minnesota all the way down to Slidell, Louisiana, as far east as uh, Peoria, Illinois, and really every place in between. So if you're playing those types of games, you have to play quite a variety of stuff. Right. It wasn't like the 50s band where you had to slick back the hair no, no, and, no. and do all those things and dress the part. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, you, you're through with the great imposters. Um, where, where's the next step? Where did you do? Well, after I got off the roof of the imposters, and it was really, um, I wanted to settle my you know, my wife and I wanted to settle down a little bit more and I wanted to uh, play on the road was fun, but it wasn't necessarily a path to like a, a, a comfortable retirement, we'll say. Uh, no, and it's, and it's hard work. I mean, people don't sometimes understand how hard that is when you are traveling, driving, staying in motels, eating out on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. so, I went back to, so I went back to school, uh, to Southeast Community College and uh, got on as an IT professional with the state of Nebraska, and I began playing in the bands around the uh, around the Lincoln area, and uh, most of that time with a band called the City Limit Band, that was uh, quite a well-known country rock band, that was active really until really until the past year or so, when one of the members develops a heart condition. Hmm. And uh, they still play a little bit. I mean, I still see their name around. Uh, yes, now and then. Um, the leader of that band has a developed kind of a heart condition so he's not as active as he was but yeah we were right. very active for almost 20 years okay good um well before we get uh, too much further i think people should give you a chance to to hear you play a little bit so let's let's play a tune you're very generous to let me uh play with you so uh, i'm going to grab my mandolin you've got your guitar um let's uh tell them a little bit about um this song you are uh, a very accomplished songwriter and as you have mentioned to me on several occasions, as we, uh, we, we tend to think in the past when we write some of our songs, and, and this is a song, even when we play sometimes, we tell people it's straight out of the, the 1930s. Yes, a 1930s style song, and it's written from the point of view of, a, of kind of a worldly woman sitting in a club looking for, looking for a partner for the night, I guess you might say, and, uh, but not just anybody. You better have something going. That's right. And so this is about that woman looking around the club and, and seeing what's available. And this is one called Don't Make Me Wait. Okay. Come on, Jerry. at the club tonight is such a bore everyone a movie that i've seen before but you might have the key to this revolving door but don't make me wait too long i'm never in the mood for some protracted ruse that's always trying to sell me something i can't use but you look like an offer that i can't refuse but don't make me wait too well, you may think I'm so refined, but I've got several things in mind that leave the birds and bees behind. So if you take my bait, 
heaven can wait. It's much too late to try to find a perfect match. So if you're looking for a wave that you can't catch, I got a little itch I think that you could scratch. But don't make me wait too long. Go, Jerry. Now you don't have to say a word. Strong and silent, my preferred. And I like everything I've heard. So if you think I'm sweet, bon appetit. The promise of tomorrow never turned me on. I'm living for the hours between dusk and dawn. So if you feel the same, why don't you tag along? But don't make me wait too long. Don't make me wait too long. Don't make me wait too long. No. Very nice. Very nice. I love that song. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of some changes um, that happened in your uh, your musical career. All of a sudden, you found jazz or at least uh, wanting to perform uh, jazz, um, a little more challenging, a little different style than, than you'd been playing? Yes, I guess what I'd say about that is um, the people that you're playing with lead you on to where, where you're going next. Uh, and that's the important part about playing in bands and things like that because it's uh, collaborative and the relationships are important. I guess I like to say that the music is the meal, but the people that you're playing with that's the sauce, that's the spice. And those are the, th the people that lead you in different directions. So I began playing around Lincoln with uh, uh, some musicians in a band called Skylark, uh, one of them being Jerry Reno. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music we were playing kind of led me on to different things and led me on to maybe uh, doing a bit more in that direction. But it was the people that I was working with that led me on to those things. Yeah, and what is it about um, jazz and um, not only jazz but um, sort of the music of the Great American Songbook, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and those kinds of things. Um, what is it about that kind of music that attracted you? Well, as, as I said, growing up, you know, I had all those things in my, uh, kind of in my memory banks from listening to them and growing up as a kid. Uh, everybody from uh, Frank Sinatra to Roger Miller, growing up as a kid, sure. listening to the radio. And uh, so I had quite a w wide variety of, you know, things stored away. and. With, as with anything else, music is like a universe. The more you understand about it, the more you see how things fit together. And the more how you see things fit together, the more things that you understand. So as I learned about how more things fit together with some of the music that we're playing in, in Skylark, that uh, kind of led me on to some different directions. And it's, you're never just leaving something behind, you're adding to what you're doing. Yeah, before we run out of time, which we're, I always tend to do <laughs> during these things, um, you uh, are now starting to play at some of the retirement communities, and that's really a nice thing to do to, to, to give back. In fact, uh, you and I played uh, at uh, a retirement community mm -hmm. just uh, um, a, a short while ago, and we, and we do want to give them a, a shout out to, to those folks. Um, they, were, uh, they were great and a real receptive audience, and that's always kind of fun to play for them. Absolutely. I'd like to thank Kathy Kyles for having us in. But yes, um, it's a way of coming full circle. When I first wanted, picked up an acoustic guitar sitting up in my room, getting out of college, I was, my idea was to, to play somebody's favorite song for them, actually, and see how it, how it worked out for them. And when you play the communities, that's, in a way, that's what you're doing. You're, you're finding these people, and you're, you're playing their, maybe their favorite song for them. And uh, as good as it makes them feel, it makes you feel even better. Yeah. And it's a way of just you know, bringing your career back f full circle, sitting there with just your guitar maybe and just your voice and getting that communication with, uh, with just one individual person. I began doing some of that with uh, playing at the re 
uh, community where my uh, mother-in-law lived, right. my, my wife's mother. Right. And uh, it just kind of grew from there. I found I really liked it. And uh, they liked it, so it was good for both of us. They are appreciative, and we're appreciative the, yes. of the fact that you are willing to, to go out and to, and to do that. You've had a great career, and it continues on. We're out of time, Gene. Thank you so much for stopping by today and continued uh, good luck and success with your career. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. And thank all of you for uh, tuning in today. I'm your host, Jerry Renault, And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and have you ever been to the Lincoln Arts Festival? It's been going on for a long time, and it's coming up, and it's very special. And we have a special person with us today, Troy Gagner. He's going to tell us about it. When did, when did the Arts Festival actually begin in Lincoln? Tell me a little of the history about it. The first year was 2000, and so for the first 18 years, the Arts Festival was, was more of an arts show and sale out at uh, South Point Pavilions in the parking lot. Uh, we had kind of grown out, outgrown that space. They were doing some construction. So in 2019, uh, we decided we really wanted to move downtown. So we co-located uh -huh. with the Lincoln Calling Music Festival at 14th and P. Um, it was great to be downtown. That location wasn't the best for us. And I think now we've kind of found our forever home down on Canopy Street in the rail yard. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, what kind of art will be shown during this? A little of everything. We have about 90 artists from around the country. Uh, everything from painters and photographers to mixed media artists, wood artists, clay artists, you name it. Uh, we've got a little bit of everything. Do you need any volunteers at this particular point in time? We do. We, we always need volunteers, particularly um, the Friday before the festival. We spend the day setting up, and so we need a lot of volunteers then and then when we tear down on Sunday night. But all throughout the festival, we need people to booth sit for artists when they need to take a break, uh, be involved with the entertainment, or just sort of general uh, volunteers throughout the festival whenever a need comes up. What's the most exciting aspect of it for you as you look at it? For this year, I think it has been all the additions. So oh. move, moving downtown um, and to our new location has really uh, opened up opportunities for us to involve a lot of other arts organizations and performers. And so we've got uh, four areas at the festival that we call creative zones. Well, there'll be interactive art activities. A number of different arts organizations are putting those on. We'll have our stage in the rail yard where we'll have performers. And uh, so I think that, for me is the most exciting part. Well, do you need more volunteers right now at this point? We do, we do. Um, and you can sign up on our website uh, at uh, lnkartsfest.com. Mm -hmm. All right, what is brand new this year that we haven't seen in the past? Anything new? Uh, one of our new features is a local maker's market, which is something new. So we're uh, working a local with- Local what? Local maker's markets. Local maker's markets. Yeah, so these are a artists- of there. Pardon? A lot of M's there. There are a lot of M's there. So these are um, new artists he from here in Lincoln. We're working with the South of Downtown Community Development Organization to put this on and, and uh, recruit those artists. So we'll have a tent uh, where we'll have about 10 makers who will be showing their art, uh, in many cases, for the first time. Oh my goodness. Now, are you going to have to be wearing masks this, yeah, and something on your face? For this, do you recommend that? Well, it's it's not a requirement with with the new directed health measures. Uh, however, uh, we want everybody to feel comfortable. So, if you feel comfortable in a mask, um, then we we say please please wear your mask. Uh, it is an outdoor event, so that does yeah. help. Mm -hmm. uh, we have spaced our artist tents out further this year than we we have in previous years. So there's a little more space, and we'll continue to encourage people to uh, keep distance between groups, but. Um, Luckily, for the way things are going in Lincoln and the number of people that have been uh, vaccinated and we've seen our infection rates drop, it's, it's good for us because we know it'll just be easier for us to have a safe festival. Can you g give me a guesstimate as to how many people actually attend this? I know it's a big deal. 
Um, you know, it's it's hard to say coming coming out of a pandemic, mm -hmm. but um, in past years we've we've averaged between seven and ten thousand, and oh, so we're wow. hoping we're hoping we can go well beyond that this year. Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, it's June nineteenth and twentieth. Yes, Is it's, that right? it's a Saturday, Sunday, June 19th and 20th. And from where do you start in the morning and end in the evening? Uh, Saturday we go from 10 to 6, and then uh, 6 p.m. we will be doing a Lincoln Calling Music Showcase with four bands in the rail yard, so that'll go from 6 to 10 p.m. And then Sunday morning we start back up actually with a yoga class at 9 a.m., and then the festival begins at 10 and we go till 5, and then it's a rush to get all the artists back on the road and back home. Mm -hmm. What, what is the location down in the Haymarket? Because, you know, there's a lot of things going on down there. Sure. So where should people go? Uh, it is, it's along Canopy Street, so uh, between O and R Street. So the north end of the festival is uh, at Pinnacle Bank Arena, and then the south end is at O Street. So we'll take up those three blocks. We'll be located right next to basically a block away from the uh, Haymarket Farmer's Market on Saturday. So if you plan to attend the farmer's market, um, you can go down there early and then head over to the festival afterwards. Now, do you have activities specially for the children? Yes, what we do. Kind of We've got all kinds of things. We've got uh, Art Bus Lincoln will be there doing art activities. What? Art Bus Lincoln is art what it's called. Art Bus Link Art Bus Lincoln, what's that? It is a new organization. Some some young women here in, in Lincoln took an old school bus, converted it into a mobile art studio. Uh, they will be down there with activities. We've got uh, Jen Landis and Pin Curl Girls. We've got Livia Studio. Altogether, we've got about 30 or so partners that will be with us doing activities or performing or um, all the other pieces of the festival. Uh, okay, now, oh, let's, what is the web address? We should know that if people want to mark it down someplace. It's, it's lnkartsfest.com. Now, this is your first year at it, right? Um, I was involved in 2019. Uh, actually, I was involved in 2018, but I wasn't the director of the fe festival then. So 2019 was my first, and we learned a lot in 2019, and, and we've made some changes, and hopefully everybody in town will appreciate the changes we've made. What are for, the big changes? Well, the location, of course, yeah. and the time of year. What um, happens if it rains? We, it's a rain or shine event, so we will be down there no matter the weather. Um, we're, we're hoping for sunny days, but that doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, but we'll be down there rain or shine. Okay, well now, wh what happens beside the Lincoln Arts Festival that you are involved in? At the Arts Council? Yeah, yeah the Arts Council. Tell we, us about the history of that. The Arts Council has been around since 1968. And you know, originally it was, it was founded by a group of people that really just wanted to focus on uh, the arts in Lincoln and, and help bring them to the forefront. Um, in more recent years, we have moved more towards providing interactive um, and engaging art activities, uh, particularly for populations that, that may not otherwise um, have those opportunities like you and I do. So we work uh, with LPS and Title I schools. We work with a lot of other human services organizations to provide um, some art programming, uh, working with the populations that they serve. We've been working a lot with uh, South of Downtown uh, over the last year, and, and we want to continue to do that, providing engaging art opportunities for, for new Americans, for, for you know, older residents, uh, for young families that may not have those opportunities. Um, really, you know, anybody, we, we want everybody to be able to enjoy the arts in Lincoln, and, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, it's kind of a level playing field for we're, everybody. We're, we're so lucky to have this, they really are. Anything else that you should know about that I have forgotten? No, I think the you know the important things are the the dates and location, June nineteenth and twentieth, um, down along Canopy Street and and in the rail yard. Um, like I said, the uh, farmers market will be there Saturday right next to us, and the Lincoln Pride Festival will actually be happening oh, oh, Friday yes. and Saturday oh. about two blocks from us as oh, well. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of fun things to do um, down in the Haymarket that weekend. Oh, thank you, Troy Gagner. But nice, nice job. Thank you. And we're Thanks looking for forward me. to seeing the Lincoln Arts Council. It's going to be fun, and I'm sure you want to be there. And don't forget, it's never too late to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Hello, I'm Bill Ainsley, your host for this segment of Live and Learn. 
One of the most widespread diseases that we face today is diabetes. If people don't take proper precautions, they can lose their sight, limbs, and even their life. Fortunately, the disease can be treated with medicine and improved diet and healthy lifestyle. With me today is Karen McWiggins, a dietitian at Lincoln Internal Medicine Associates. Karen, welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me to talk on this important topic. Karen, please tell us about your qualifications and the meanings of the letters in the qualifications. I know you have a great deal of information about what you eat can affect diabetes and prediabetes. There's a great deal of difference between the two conditions. Well, as a dietitian and a diabetes educator, um, I work with people on nutrition counseling to provide uh, healthy lifestyle changes uh, for issues that relate to diet and lifestyle. In diabetes and prediabetes, your primary care provider will diagnose those according to lab results and according to those levels. And they may take the test several times. The American Diabetes Association has at least five standards for nutrition therapy. They say that managing your weight and food are very important. Well, we have listed five of, of the standards of nutrition therapy by American Diabetes Association. And those include one, working on excess weight and losing five to 7% even is effective in helping our insulin work better in the body and lowering glucose levels. Second, activity is really key and finding a safe and uh, enjoyable type of plan that you like and can maintain will change glucose levels. The third area is behavioral changes. And that might include increasing your sleep. That may be more time for hobbies and uh, connections with friends and family for lowering stress, but also to maintain healthy eating and exercise. The fourth and maybe the first is going back to that primary care provider and really discussing your priorities personally in taking care of your health. And with that, um, our hope is that they send you to resources and diabetes educators and, and get the tools to better uh, understand and learn about this disease. The last part that Bill, that uh, you asked me to address um, relating to hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, two of the issues for you and the provider to discuss. And 70 to 100 is the normal blood glucose level in a fasting state. Uh, after eating two hours after a meal, the normal is under 140. So in hyperglycemia, in a diabetic state, people will run much higher numbers, 150, 200. And again, talk to your provider on your levels. In hypoglycemia, that may be a low normal or below 70. For purposes of full disclosure, I should tell you that Karen is a dietitian in my doctor's office and is helping me with meal planning. And there are different meal plans for people with diabetes and prediabetes. Well, creating a food plan is really important to starting to make long-term changes in your diet and, and to make it not a temporary diet of types, but it takes time to get to know people's food preferences and to find what will work for them. So in that meal plan, the diabetes educator or dietitian is, is going to work to balance out food choices um, they're going to find your food habits. Maybe they add a healthy snack midday so we don't overeat at dinner. Maybe they add protein another time. So it, it will take time to develop a personal health, me, healthy meal plan. Now, I'm a meat and potatoes guy, and that might need to change a bit. Someone once told me that my salad days were ahead of me. A good mixture of food is maybe a good idea. Well, a mixture of food is very healthy and, and you can keep your meat and potatoes. We just wanna add other plant foods and, and balance the picture. Uh, we want that meal to satisfy hunger and your food preferences and good nutrition. So uh, think about a pot roast or a bowl of chili. 
are great ways to get combinations of, of plants and proteins. Now the foods in this slide include beans, seeds and nuts, grains, uh, protein, and a perfect picture we would have more dairy and, and more colorful fruits and vegetables. But it is key that we continue to add in these healthy choices and to find our preferences, to find ways to improve old recipes by adding other ingredients and uh, just balancing the picture. The grapefruit on this picture uh, is one example of a food that uh, frequently doesn't work with medications. So check with your provider if there are any foods to uh, keep out of the diet or if there's any limitations. Me, I don't usually eat seafood. So what do you think would be a good mixture for me? Well, to get similar nutrients, we can uh, look at olive oil and nuts and avocado and other foods with omega-3s uh, along with other lean protein sources. Well, changing my diet might become necessary even though I still enjoy my steak. There are some things to do when making the change. Well, Bill, I should help you with lean cuts of steak, of loin and round are two magic words in that world. Uh, and then again, you can have your steak dinner when we add some other plants on the side and we, we moderate some starch portions to help keep your blood glucose levels in a good range. Many folks have seen the food plate where different types of food and portion sizes are shown. You don't have to do this exactly but it gives you a pretty good idea of how much of what you should eat. Well, my plate is a good combination of nutrient study to uh, take care of the health needs of most people. And again, it will take time to add in some of those foods, but it also prevents people from the concern that they're going to be hungry, they're going to be on a low calorie diet and that they they have their preferences. They've just added some side dishes. So the plate also decreases our needs for more sugar and fat, our intake of those foods, but we can have those in smaller amounts. Remember, if you want more information, go to choosemyplate.gov. Maybe now you have changed your diet a little. You can still have the good stuff. You can still have a little candy and a few sweets. You just have to be a little careful and do things in moderation. If you have diabetes or prediabetes, you can keep track of what you eat. Well, this slide is a good example of uh, the questions that a provider would ask when you come in. Of what are you doing to take care of yourself? And any recording and any tracking of blood glucose levels, of your food intake two days a week, your minutes of exercise will give them good feedback, but will also help you see uh, the lifestyle changes you can make to improve your blood glucose levels. Uh, so it will take time, but, but it's, it's a, a quick process, which only truly takes a few minutes each day. There are numerous diet plans. Some may work for some folks and not others. Mm -hmm. Consult with a professional to find a plan that is good for you? Well, the DASH diet and Mediterranean are worth review. And if you've heard of these before, we know they lower blood pressure, they're good for heart health, and they really provide a high nutrient intake, uh, which fights colds and flus and viruses. So uh, the beauty is that they also help stabilize blood sugar and um, are, are definitely uh, easy foods to add to your daily diet. I really enjoy my Bran Flakes cereal in the morning, and I know that fiber is important to a good diet. Well, Bill, adding fiber is smart, and the fiber in plant foods is proven to be key. One of the top standards in 2021, American Diabetes Association is uh, increasing our fiber to lower blood glucose levels. It stabilizes 
those levels and uh, keeps us full and does many other health benefits for the body. There is much more to diets for people with prediabetes and diabetes than we've had time to discuss today. Karen, what do you think should be said? Well, bring, bring your records to your provider, bring your questions, um, ask them to help you in setting those medical goals each year and realize they change with age, they change with time. Um, but I think in doing all that, you gain confidence in, in taking better care of yourself and that it is worthwhile to make some, some food and exercise and lifestyle changes. Well, Karen, we're about out of time. So we've been talking today with Karen McWilliams, a dietitian at Lincoln Internal Medicine Associates. Karen, it has been a real pleasure to have you on the program today. Well, thank you. And I, and I encourage people to keep learning new ways to take care of their health. I think it takes away the stress. It gives us confidence, but it truly improves our numbers. And it's things that we can do in our daily lifestyle for ourselves and and then uh, promote that to others. For more information about diets, prediabetes or diabetes, please contact your healthcare professional. Karen, thanks again for being on today. I want to remind everyone that it is never too late to eat right and live and learn. <music>